Okay. Well, welcome everyone. It's great to see so many of you here. I'm Bill Sanders, Professor of Department of Electrical, uh, of Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, and some of you may know me as the uh, the past PI of the TSIBG uh, project. Uh, it's really my honor to be able to introduce David Nickel today. Uh, uh, and he will be kicking off our new seminar series, which is the CREDSI uh, seminar series. I'm going to keep you in the dark, although many of you know what CREDSI is all about, because that's what David's going to talk about today. Um, it's my particular honor to be able to do this um, because of David's uh, leadership in this new effort, and I guess an appropriate uh, handing off of the baton uh, from uh, me to, to him. Uh, in the lead leadership of, of these kinds of things. Um, let me tell you a little bit about uh, David. David is also a professor of electrical and computer engineering. He's the director of the Information uh, Trust Institute. That's our large center here at Illinois that looks broadly at issues of cybersecurity, dependability, safety, and other aspects related to trust. He's the Franklin W. Wooltridge Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering here at the University of Illinois. And in addition to being the PI of the new CREDSI project, which he's going to tell you about, he's also the PI of the DHS-funded Critical Infrastructure Resilience Institute. Um, before he came here uh, to Illinois, and he's been with us quite a while now, he was professor and department head of computer science at um, Dartmouth College, and uh, he also was a faculty member at the College of William and Mary. I could go on with all of his accomplishments. You can read them in the bio, um, but I think I'll let David come on because we've got uh, exciting things to tell you about the new project. Just to remind you, uh, if you would like to ask a question, and if you've logged in through our WebEx interface, uh, there's a button somewhere there that you can push with a hands up. In the chat. Oh, in the chat. You can type your question in the chat, and then we'll read your question to David, and, and he could respond. So let's give a round of applause to David Nickel and let him take the stage. There's the baton. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you all for coming. It's a pleasure and an honor to be uh, introducing CREDC now. Um, so I'd like to drill down a little bit on the title and the objective of the center well, with reference to past history. So as many of you know, we've been in the business of looking at cybersecurity issues in the power grid for rather a long time, starting with TSIP and then TSIP-G. Uh, this is in some sense, phase three, but it is different. And it's different for um, a couple of reasons. One is that the emphasis of this center is on resilience. Now, I had some educational challenges in getting the communications people to move away from locks in the logo to something that wasn't just locks, because locks suggest security. And resilience um, has security as a component, but it's, it's more than that. Uh, resilience has to do some with being able to withstand the either cyber attacks or cyber mistakes that happen. Um, it has to do with being able to deliver um, a uh, necessary minimal degree of performance in the midst of some kind of an event. It has to do with the ability to recover quickly from that. It has to do with situational awareness so that you know what's happening. Part of the situa situational awareness has to do with being able to do risk assessments. And that's part of your knowledge of the systems that you've got. So the point that I wanted to make is that the center uh, is much more than just about security. Security will continue to play an important role, but not by any means the only role. Another important difference between the center and the past centers that we um, have been involved in is that this has to do with energy delivery. Not just power, but energy delivery. When the biggest other component of energy delivery would be oil and gas. 
but it could include you know, tanker trucks on the highway. And this was all by design of the sponsor DOE when they put out the call for proposals. It was to be about resilience and it was about to be uh, energy delivery. So <clears throat> as we go forward, keep in mind mm -hmm. that it's not just security anymore. It's bigger than that. So if you want to have the elevator pitch, what's the elevator pitch for CredC? And that is what we're about is to identify and perform the cutting edge research and development, and here the emphasis, whose results are actually used, and this is a theme, to which we will return again and again and again, to increase cyber resilience of energy delivery systems. So the emphasis here should be on cutting edge, that's why it's at a university, but also results are actually used, which is why uh, the sponsor is particularly keen on seeing uh, results come out of this and be placed into practice. There are a number of objectives along the way to help sort of accomplish this goal. One of those is to do things that we haven't really done before, haven't emphasized before, and that's to understand energy delivery systems, cyber resilience, uh, investment, from the point of the highest level decision makers. Because if you're gonna have the stuff be actually used, you have to convince the people who actually have money to invest in the things so that they actually get used. And so you have to understand their view of this and you have to be able to communicate to them in ways that they understand and that they see the value and do it. And actually you have to create the value for the C-suite to invest in this sort of thing. So this is a non-trivial problem uh, and is one that we take on directly. Part of what it is that we need to do is to survey the landscape, stay on top of what's happening, to identify the gaps and the impediments in the technologies and the policies and decision making to that keep us from achieving higher resilience of energy delivery systems. And among that very large space, and I'm sure it's a very large space, prioritize on those things that we can do that are going to have highest impact while being adoptable. As academics, we are uh, absolutely skilled, practiced, and superb at solving amazingly hard, complex problems um, that look great in the leading journals. But the gap between that and practice is large. Now that's something that we as academics need to do. That is something that as academics we will continue to do. But for the purposes of this center, we need to prioritize on things that are gonna be adoptable. And so things that are um, um, uh, computationally too complex or too expensive in, in the lifetime of this, of this center, uh, we would not prioritize for those. We need to uh, develop solutions, we need to validate them, um, and we need to do this in coordination with industry because it is industry that is going to adopt these things. And again, this is a theme to which we return, but partnership with industry is, has been strong in the past and is strong with CredC. We need to be able to make the solutions that we develop here available. Uh, it's called transition to practice, and there are a number of ways that this can be done, a number of ways we've done it in the past, and uh, we will uh, work to do that in the future. Some of those ways is to develop technology that's attractive enough for entrepreneurs to build companies around and license it and sell it. And under TCIPG, there were a number of these that occurred. Some of the ways that solutions are made available is by adoption by some large entity who likes it so much that they say, we'll take this, we'll maintain it, we'll use it. It's not necessarily uh, made available commercially, but somebody is interested in it and takes it on. Um, so that would be a win as well. One of the ways that uh, we can make our solutions available is to put them in open source, but that of course is not the end of the story. It's not that you give somebody a GitHub URL, you say, there it is, come and get it, because it might just lie there and gather dust. No, what you need to do if you're putting things in open source 
is to work to establish a community, build a community around it who's using it, who continues to uh, upgrade it and take it on as their own. And there are a number of examples of this sort of things. And there may be other ways that I didn't think to include in this, but the main point is that what happens, what comes out of here needs to be made available. And, and this is a challenge, uh, we are directed by our sponsor to develop a model of operation that at the end of five years is self-supporting. And so um, this has to be foremost in our minds as we develop the way we do things, is the idea that at the end of five years, um, we need to have an institute that, uh, whose boat is floated by means other than another big grant from the Department of Energy. And so I think we all know whose uh, money is going to float that boat, and that would be industry. And so it behooves us from the beginning to develop a model that is appreciated by industry enough so that they see the value uh, to invest in us um, after, the, after the center is uh, completed. We are a university, and because we're a university, we have important educational goals as well. What we have done in the past and will continue to do in the future is to develop students who, have, who may come from power engineering but have an appreciation and understanding of things cyber, who, students who come from a cyber side and have some understanding and appreciation of power and perhaps um, other energy delivery systems. This is unusual. The graduates that we have put out that have had these combined joint sets have been highly sought by industry. So we have done this in the past. We will continue to do this in the future because it's really important to have people who understand both sides of this uh, out, in the, out in the field, uh, designing, maintaining, implementing these sorts of systems. Another important educational component of what we're doing is reaching out to the workforce. I cannot tell you the number of times when talking with working stiff engineers at, uh, in, in industry that says, here is this technology. Um, I'm supposed to be able to understand it and use it. And that I, I don't understand what to do. I don't, <laughs> how, do I, how do I get my head around this? So this is a place where uh, educators, and we are educators, can develop curriculum that, and deliver it uh, to go to the workforce um, and, and give them material that they need to know to do their jobs better in the resiliency space. We need to go to where industry is and make them aware of what it is that we're doing, um, uh, make them aware of uh, opportunities for education, make them aware of the challenges that exist in the resiliency space. And the way that we see this happening is going to where industry gathers itself at industrial uh, workshops and forums. Mm -hmm. And so the idea, and we've done this in the past, is to have some come aside meeting that, uh, that happens alongside an industry meeting or after or before an industry meeting. The people are going there already. They have suffered the, it's called amortizing the startup costs of the, uh, of the participants to, to come and, and see what we have to offer as well as whatever meeting it is that uh, they have come primarily to attend. We have in the past through TCIPG uh, created and delivered a week-long summer school. Uh, we put that on the proposal and we will be doing that again. The first offering of that will be in 2017. So can't say that you put that on your calendars yet, but you can have a placeholder that summer school will happen in 2017 once again. And as in the past, we will be doing outreach to K through 12 uh, through innovative educational initiatives. Um, as in the past, uh, Jana, I think she, she said, there's Jana, yep, she's been doing a great job for us uh, in going to where the students and the parents and the teachers are. Uh, giving them hands-on sorts of things to illustrate the point, to have clever websites that are interactive to, to illustrate the point, uh, to, uh, to go to the state fair and have booths there to let people know what it is that's, that's going on. So here it's not just for the students, but it's for their parents and for uh, their teachers as well. Wanted to say a little bit about um, the research team that we've got. At the core of the team are uh, the institutions, uh, one by 
uh, transition um, that started with TCIP-G and I mean TCIP and then TCIP-G. So and that team was Illinois, Washington State, uh, Dartmouth, Cornell. Then Anna went to Davis, and now Anna is at at uh, ASU. But it's it's essentially the same team. So Anna Scaglione um, is leading the effort at ASU. Anna is a double E. Um, does a lot of work in uh, mathematical models, um, but has a great cybersecurity team at ASU that is um, joining our team here as well. Sean Smith, uh, a longtime collaborator, uh, is you know Mr. Uh, security in the Northeast, um, very interested in scaling issues in um, in uh, cybersecurity in the power space. Washington State um, has long been um, a leader in uh, infrastructure for uh, looking at combining the, uh, the cyber side and, and the power side. Carl Hauser leads that, uh, and we're delighted to have them on the team. And then Illinois, and I don't need to say anything more about uh, Illinois because we're at Illinois. Um, we have been around a while doing this sort of thing, and we have had graduates of a sort. So Saman Sanoz uh, was one of Bill Sanders' students. Saman's gone on to be a professor at Rutgers, and uh, he and his team join CredC as well. Uh, Rakesh Boba was um, a research scientist and a, a research uh, professor here at Illinois. Uh, got the itch to go on the tenure track, and so he went off to OSU, and there's a great team at OSU of people that are in this space that bring their talents and interests to CredC as well. So these are sort of second generation TCIP, TCIP-G uh, folks. Then at another level, we have uh, new members, entirely new members uh, to the team. Uh, Art Conklin, um, who's from the University of Houston, is the person that we could uh, identify uh, working the cybersecurity angle in oil and gas. So as we reached out to oil and gas, we asked ourselves, who's the go-to person in academics who's doing that? And Art was the go-to person in that, so we're delighted to have him and his team as well. Um, I could tell you stories about the partnership with, with MIT. Uh, what I find interesting about it is as we thought about who we should approach another top tier university to join the team and settled in on MIT, we sent an invitation to them, which crossed the wires with an inquiry from MIT to us about partnering. How about that? So uh, Stuart Madnick um, is the leader of that team. Um, MIT is bringing two really strong, interesting, different components to this. Uh, one of those is Stewart has an affiliation with the Sloan School of Business. And so this whole notion of being able to speak to the C-suite is, is something that they've been doing for a while and bring to this team as well. And then there's the classical um, world-class um, uh, technology stuff that MIT brings to the table, networks and networks, uh, modeling, um, resiliency, and the whole nine yards. So we're delighted to have them on the team. Uh, we also have Sashin Seti from Tennessee State University. Sashin is a cybersecurity guy with his team that's involved in uh, resilient control systems. Been working with Sashin for some years. He sends uh, one of his graduate students to work with me every summer. Uh, so delighted to have Sashin and his students on the team as well. And then finally, to round it out, we have a couple of national labs. Um, um, Pacific Northwest National Lab, the team's led by Paul Scari. Among the national labs, we understand PNNL to be the leader in, um, in power. And among national labs, we understand Argonne to be the leader in oil and gas. And Shabir uh, Shamsuddin uh, leads that as well. The role of the national labs in this is to bring you know, their um, leading visions for this thing, their Rolodexes of context that they have, um, uh, greater outreach into the community, understanding of problems, some of which uh, we can't know about because they're classified, um, and to have a strong role in the validation and verification piece of the CredC technology that we'll do. So that's, uh, that's the CredC team, all 11 of us. The overall approach that we envision to uh, conducting CredC can be viewed as sort of a pipeline, where on the left-hand side, there's what we'll call long-term research activities. And by long-term here, I mean that it's research um, that will have a 
maybe three year lifetime at least um, before getting to a point where you might actually consider you know, building any sort of prototype. So it's the deep thinking uh, piece of it. So um, with that deep thinking, we do things like um, uh, analyze the theoretical feasibility of some sort of uh, approaches to things and of course find the ones that aren't going to work and uh, leave them uh, by the wayside. Um, some of the deep thinking has to do with uh, gap analysis. Some has to do, we hope, with uh, long range influence of uh, standards and uh, policy. Um, we would hope come out of this in uh, conversation with people who make policy and establish standards. Um, the visionary thinking that um, is part of long term research will be informed by our conversation with senior people uh, in industry to identify what they see as their needs. And this will help us, it will inform us as we um, strategize about the directions we ought to go. And I'll say more about that in the industrial advisory board that we have. So some of the things that um, come out of long-term research uh, may be identified as, you know, this stuff is nearly ready to go. And there may be other opportunities, there will be oppor other opportunities of things that don't necessarily come out of the CREDC long-term research pipeline, but are near-term things that we can do with maybe a year or so of applied research and a year or so of development to produce some sort of prototype that can be demonstrated and tested and validated. It'd be the core piece for transitional uh, technology that might go somewhere else. So that's the, the role that the midterm R&D plays in this. And particularly in this stretch of, of, of R&D, uh, we see industry playing a really important role. Um, they will help us prioritize the things we ought to invest in that will lead to these, these prototypes. Uh, they will help us, they will have seats on the panels that select which projects um, have this sort of investment. We will be looking to have come alongside each one of these projects some sort of um, industry advocate for it who's involved uh, throughout. And ideally, at the end of the project, would be uh, the champion that would see uh, the project uh, evaluated uh, at their own company in their own test beds. So uh, industry plays a very strong role there. So we roll out this technology. Um, in the course of rolling it out, we're doing some experiments, we're doing some development. Um, all of that is done through our test beds and the ver verification and validation efforts. So the notion is that after we have uh, some technology, it's not just you know, send out a mass email, come and get it, but it's to put it through its paces, to design uh, experiments, uh, to uh, approach it with some rigor to find out what it does well, identify what it doesn't do well or doesn't do at all, document all of that and make that available so that when someone comes to say, say, I heard about such and such a tool, what can I learn about that? You can see this is who developed it, these are the tests that it went through, this is what came out of it, and uh, so people can make uh, decisions to adopt it or not that are more informed. There are a number of trends that have affected the DOE roadmap and cred C um, activities are very much aligned with uh, the DOE roadmap and so they are trends that affect the research that we have. Uh, one of those trends is that technology, both on what my friend, there's Pete in the bright orange shirt. You should get the cameras turned around and look at the bright orange shirt. So, so Pete talks about the big wire and the little wire, right? And so the little wire is cyber stuff and the big wire is the real power stuff. There are changes that are happening on both wires that create opportunities that, uh, for uh, disruption and call those attack surfaces. So something like the Internet of Things, whether you like it or not, um, the world is becoming awash with devices that communicate uh, with other devices uh, through protocols, uh, make connections, and those connections will find their way into the power system. And that should be a point of concern because it has increased the surface through which one might approach the power system. Again, whether you like it or not, cloud computing is happening. There are economic forces that will drive um, uh, the uh, companies to have to at least consider 
using cloud services for some of the things that they do because that's where those services will exist. Um, there are considerable concerns one ought to have uh, about security and resiliency in the cloud. And so uh, those are the sorts of things that will uh, impact um, our thinking. On the big wire side, um, you will see more and more distributed uh, generation. You have distributed generation, that means more coordination, that means more communication, that means more ways for things to become fouled up, either by malicious design or just by bad configurations. All of that affect resilience. And so that sort of development on the big wire side uh, is of uh, importance to us. And uh, another possibility would be with increased uh, vehicle, electric vehicle infrastructure. Um, now you've got your cars that are maybe charging up in the garages. Perhaps they can be used as batteries uh, to help control the power grid. You can imagine a world where there's this complex uh, ecosystem involving cars moving around, um, um, billing, um, uh, <coughs> connection to the power grid. You know, opportunities are legion there, but many more problems may be exposed there as well. So those, those are just examples of technology that, uh, that's coming that can create new attack services. The adversary is evolving. The adversary is getting smarter. Um, when the uh, white hat guys uh, do something, the black hat guys find a way around it. It's this yin and yang, this ever nending uh, 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 back and forth that goes on. So as we approach this, we have to, ideally we would get ahead of the curve. We wouldn't just react to what the adversaries can do, but we have to be very aware that we can never play a pat hand, that the adversary is evolving, and so must our technology. Um, there's a push uh, for economic reasons towards standardization in all sorts of ways. Uh, this is good for economics. Um, it's bad if you believe in uh, security or resilience through diversity or resilience uh, through obscurity because more and more things will be uh, the, the same. And so that's a concern. Compliance um, is an issue that is very much on the minds of our um, uh, folks that are doing uh, power uh, with the recent uh, change in the NERC SIP requirements, uh, more uh, utilities are um, uh, caught in the um, area that uh, where compliance must be must be performed. So we hear from the utilities they spend a tremendous amount of time on this activity, and frankly, they see it as um, a burden. Uh, what we would hope to do is to do two things. One is to help identify the areas where a technology can help, not only to reduce the compliance burden, but to give the companies more information about the systems that they've got. I think the, what we would like to do for all of our things is find solutions that not only make things more resilient, but which, you know, resilience in the event of bad things that happen, but, but hope to uh, increase the efficiency of the overall operation to make the whole thing good. That's the way you sell it to the C-suite is that you say, if you do these things, then um, you're getting a better return, um, you you're have less downtime, and, and so on. So all of these are, are things that, are of, uh, uh, that will influence the decisions that we make in choosing the projects. Um, there's increased integration of renewable energies. Um, you know, it's a story that I told before. You have more systems, they have to coordinate, they have to communicate, and because they're coordinating, communicating, uh, that means more opportunities to gum up the works. And uh, we would like not to have that happen. Uh, increased monitoring and control. This is a two-edged sword. Um, there will be more of that, so you have better situational awareness of what's going on. But again, you have more uh, exposure to um, uh, things that are actually more dependence. You, you imagine you have monitoring that's going on. And uh, if, if the data that's being reported through the monitoring is somehow uh, corrupted, and so that you have sensors that are not telling the right story, then you have new problems. And so we um, have to be aware of that. So uh, increased monitoring and control has a plus side and a minus side, and all of these affect the uh, decisions we make about the research that we do. So overall, CredC has a um, number of activity tracks. And I'll talk about some of these in, in more detail. One um, has to do with long-term research. Uh, one has to do with midterm research and development. 
And third has to do with uh, verification and validation, and I spoke to um, all of these earlier. Uh, we have a strong component of industrial outreach uh, and impact. The kinds of ways that we accomplish this would be through um, an industry day, uh, through the workforce development uh, uh, curriculum that I talked about, uh, white papers that the Cred Seed leadership will be developing that's identifying sort of an area of uh, interest or concern uh, for people in this space and what our thoughts are. It isn't a white paper asking somebody for money, it's just our white paper thinking, saying, you know, here's a problem and this is our, what our solutions um, are for it. And then um, uh, we also have uh, the summer school coming up as well. And then the, uh, the K through 12 education and public outreach. So um, everything that we do in CREDC falls into one of those, one of those tracks. Did I mention that industry plays a really important role in CREDC, or we would like industry to play a really important role in CREDC? And so the, the particular places I can point to where that happens, um, one is in the uh, industry or industrial advisory board, which you can think of as being uh, an executive level inner circle. who are working with the CREDC leadership uh, on strategic directions, um, gaps that they see, needs that they see the industry has uh, overall, and we hope in uh, aid with the transition to practice, making sure the stuff that we do uh, sees uh, the light of day in practice. Uh, we have another layer of participation by industry. We call them the Industry Participation Board, um, and that would be people from industry who are involved in our projects, uh, um, uh, either giving advice to the uh, projects uh, themselves or giving advice to the uh, senior leadership. But basically, um, what we look for to have someone be uh, in the participation board is a willingness to spend some cycles with us and, and help us out. And then part of the self-sufficiency uh, plan that we have for uh, CREDC um, is to introduce the notion of CREDC members. And so we would have uh, members that are paying annual dues uh, to be part of this. And they might, you might ask, what do they get for their annual dues? Uh, one of the things that they get is direct influence on the selection of the midterm projects. So credency members will have a seat on the board um, of the project selection. Uh, they'll have early access to uh, white papers that they will request us to write. And so um, you can imagine a, a, a topic popping up and uh, the CREDC uh, folks would uh, put together a white paper that's directed to that uh, topic and then it would be available to the members for some period of time, you know, some, some maybe half a year uh, before we go public on it. But, you know, they asked for it, they paid for it in some sense and so they get the first access to it and we will um, make sure that they have access to our students uh, because everybody wants access to the students at the University of Illinois and especially students that come out of uh, activities like TC and CREDC, and we want to make sure that the uh, dues-paying members have um, the best shot. And, That's, and the other schools, too. And the other schools, too. Yes. Thank you, Bill. No, it's true. So it's, it's um, I, I speak naturally from an Illinois-centric point of view, but this is not to denigrate the role of, of other um, uh, others um, at, at all. In fact, and, and I will say it, so uh, we hope that this, this seminar series uh, will have manifestation not just here, but at some of these other schools as well when we have guest speakers. And so that'll be one of the visible means by which we uh, see this. And when we have industry days, um, we can have industry days. We will have industry days at locations other than Illinois as well. So you know, the other members are very much part of, the, part of the team here. Thank you for reminding me of that, Bill. So the Industrial Advisory Board that's in place right now, uh, we have some new names and some familiar names. So a new name is Mark Browning, who's a senior guy um, at uh, Exelon. I am delighted uh, to have him here. He um, uh, has uh, connections to Illinois and has been involved with us for a couple of years in identifying uh, problem areas that uh, he needs help in or Exelon needs help in. So uh, we're just delighted when he joined the board. Uh, Dennis Gamel from Schweitzer. Dennis um, has you know, another long-term um, uh, partner with us and has been on the TCFG board, I believe. Uh, so delighted that, that Dennis joins us. He's uh, head of R&D at, at Schweitzer. Uh, Richard Jackson, um, who until recently was a senior person at Chevron. I believe he's retired now, but he still has his Rolodex. He still has experience. He still has his insights. 
and we're very delighted to have him uh, join the board as well. Hamanchu Karana. So Hamanchu back in the day, well, he was a staff scientist that worked with us. And then he was recruited by Honeywell and he shot to the stratosphere and the management structure of Honeywell just because he was that good. Uh, and so we're delighted to have him uh, continue to uh, uh, work with us uh, now in an advisory role. Uh, Blake Larson from Western Refinery. This is part of our uh, growth into the oil and gas. Uh, Blake is no stranger to the DOE SEDS program. Um, even though he's new to our board, we've met him at SEDS program things uh, and were taken by the fact that, that he understood the, um, the cyber side issues uh, that we were looking at, the power side, and he wanted to see that transfer to the oil and gas side, and so he's on the board to help have that happen. Scott Mix from NERC and Paul Myrna from EPRI and Dave Norton from FERC, our friends that have been with us probably from the TSIP days. Um, and delighted they are still uh, willing and interested in uh, giving us advice well as they have done uh, in the past. Uh, Kimmy Tam, someone that a number of us have worked with over the decades. Uh, Kimmy is uh, in the Cyber Defense Engineering and Science Directorate, um, so brings a, a different perspective uh, uh, to the issues that we have, uh, one from one of the labs, but also uh, from one of the labs that does a lot of work in this space, particularly uh, in oil and gas. So we're delighted that uh, Timmy, uh, Kimmy joined us. And then Zach Tudor. Zach's just a lot of fun and a very, very smart guy. If there is a government activity that has the word cyber and infrastructure in it someplace, Zach is there. And so we're delighted that he is here on our board as well. So that's our advisory board. Um, we may have some additions as time goes on, but it's, uh, I hope you agree, a good team to start off with. And we have already had our first meeting with them. Now, I'm not going to bore you. Well, maybe I will. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to try to bore you with spending too much time on the overall management structure of currency. But I just, you know, when you go and you meet a, an industry, uh, you know, oftentimes what they'll do is they'll flash an org chart. And what they're trying to do is to tell you the way things happen in this organization. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to flash an org chart that sort of does that, but really to emphasize where we think there are important things, uh, that so much so that we um, put it in the infrastructure. So uh, we have uh, project management uh, folks, which include myself as the PI, uh, the Illinois co-PIs, and all of the site leads. In addition to the uh, outstanding Illinois admin team you know about, which includes uh, Sherry, which includes Ted Yardley, which includes Al Valdez. They are full partners in the management and direction of this thing. And so they are there as well. Plus our industrial advisory board. These are busy, important people. So we don't want to uh, put too much of a burden on them, but we interact with them, uh, say quarterly, uh, through the telephone and, and expect and hope that they would uh, come to the industry day um, as well to face to face. So this is where uh, directional stuff comes from. Down at the where other things happen, not the direction, but the things that get directed. Uh, some of it is the research and, and, and outreach that happens, of course. Uh, we have industrial participation with that. The reason why I pull up these subcommittees is these are standing committees that we have defined for CREDC. And the reason why I put them here is to show you where we think there is activity that CREDC needs to be doing that is so important that these are the six things that we create committees to stay on top of. One of those is how do we select the activities that we're going to invest in? And how do we evaluate them? One of them is what are the gaps and what are the research opportunities? We can't just launch this thing and go on cruise control for five years. We need to be staying on top of what's happening. And so we um, have a group that's responsible for doing that. We have to be looking for opportunities for transitioning the results that come out of CREDC into practice. So we have a subcommittee for that. Uh, industry outreach is critically important. So we have a subcommittee de dedicated to that. Education and workforce development talked about that. And then finally, self-sustainability. All these are the six you know, main things in addition to the research and outreach that CREDC does um, that, uh, that we put in the substructure. So now you can all wake up again and get past the org chart and on to perhaps more interesting things, and that's the, the research tasks. So in the midterm research and development, we've identified um, five activities right now that fit the bill. 
that we're looking at about a year of applied research, about a year of development, and then we'll have something that's ready for testing and evaluation. So uh, one of those has to do with lightweight uh, delay-aware scalable uh, cryptographic surfaces for uh, smart grid systems. This is something that's coming out of uh, Oregon State uh, University. Um, one of them has to do with secure dynamic interoperability of microgrid assets. That's a University of Illinois project. Um, and so this has to do with a framework, a secure framework for coordination uh, between uh, distributed generation uh, entities. Uh, uh, three of these uh, have to do with work that is really uh, was launched under TCIPG and is ready to graduate to this next level of, of um, transition and impact. One of those has to do with um, uh, PMU data quality, analyzing the dependency that we have on the quality of the PMU data and uh, what to do in case it becomes compromised or just bad. Uh, robust and secure GPS timing. Um, so uh, I think uh, the dependency that we have or the fact that GPS could be corrupted got lots of people's attention when a drone went down in Iran, uh, probably coaxed down by a spoofing of, of GPS. It's a real problem since so much of the state information that's gathered in the grid um, is time stamped off of GPS, then it's important that uh, we be able to deal with, understand that threat and deal with it. And so uh, there's um, near term stuff that we can develop and deliver having to do with that. And then anomaly of detection for securing communications in, in AMI. So AMI is everywhere. And um, so we need to be concerned about that as a vehicle for um, bad things uh, being introduced into the system. Oops. I just got a, all right. Moving right along. So there are um, seven long-term research areas. There's a whole slew of activities and projects, and I will not numb you with all of that. What I'll do is I'll talk to each of these seven overall areas and understand that there are multiple activities involving multidisciplinary and multi-university teams uh, in each of those to just give you a sense of where the focal points of the long-term research uh, in CredC uh, is. So one of those areas is in uh, cyber protection. By this, we mean the, we need to protect the cyber infrastructure that's involved in energy delivery systems. We need to protect it from cyber attack. We need to protect it from fat thumbs of uh, operators, uh, uh, misconfigurations, and so on. One of the ways that one can provide uh, that sort of protection is by cross-validation. And so when you're looking at cyber information or cyber in commands, you can cross-validate that with models and measurements of the physical system and ask the question, does this make sense in this context? And so we have a number of activities that, that look at that sort of thing. Uh, cyber monitoring, metrics, and evaluation. Metrics are like a really big deal. Metrics in, in security have been on hard problems lists for over a decade now, and they're still there because it's a hard problem um, and continues to be. Uh, but one hopes that, we hope that, we expect that with some focus in well-defined de engineered systems, we can find metrics that um, correlate with cyber events in part because what you expect these systems to do um, is, is better known than in sort of the wild west of, of enterprise systems. And so we have uh, reason to believe that uh, metrics and evaluation of those metrics um, will have traction in this particular space. That said, uh, we need to be able to do our measurement in a way that doesn't perturb things. It needs to be lightweight. It needs to be um, even transparent. You'd, um, to be off to the side. You, these are real-time systems. It's well known that if you do something like pop yourself into a, a control system and do a port scan on it, chances are pretty good that you're going to send that system go pause up, right? It just, they're just not engineered for that sort of thing. And so we have to tread lightly here. And so the real questions are how do we do that? Uh, here's another area where in the monitoring we need to be able to uh, leverage the physical state for uh, validity checks against the data that um, uh, is there. And from a um, sort of a step back uh, mathematical point of view, you're looking at all this data, there's uncertainties about the data itself, there's uncertainties in the metrics, uh, uncertainties in the analysis that we make from this, uncertainties in the risk models that we have, all of this 
there is uncertainties and risks whenever you have models and data, and uh, it behooves us to have a firm theoretical understanding um, of that. So when we have a metric, we can say this is, this is a good value or this is a value that I really need to correlate with other things. How much do you trust this data? Important long-term sort of research area. Uh, speaking of risk assessment, um, that looms large in the thinking of many people that we talk about, or that we talk to. Um, one of the aspects of risk assessment is being able to forecast um, the uh, cyber events that might occur in, uh, in EDS systems. So part of that has to do with situational awareness and understanding of what you're seeing in the state um, that make it uh, more likely or not that there's uh, uh, intruders uh, in your midst and uh, cyber events that are, that are likely to happen. Part of risk assessment has to do with mathematical models that allow you to look at a model of a system and say, these are the risks due to the presence of these components with these vulnerabilities or these couplings, that sort of thing. This is the kind of stuff that we need to develop to be able to communicate with decision makers. Decision makers in this space think about things in terms of risk. And so we need to be able to talk to them in terms of risk. We need to be able to talk to them in terms that they understand. And uh, uh, so we have well-founded engineering reasons uh, for recommending uh, uh, solutions that we would put forward. Um, data privacy is uh, an interesting uh, area here. Uh, there is um, going to, there is now, and there'll be an ever increasing um, uh, agglomeration of data that's gathered in EDS, some of which, um, for a variety of reasons, may uh, need to be shared or is advantageous to, sh to be shared. But since the grid is operated by a bunch of independent, sometimes competing entities, then there are concerns about what can be learned from the data. Uh, either from, from a security point of view of what can be learned <clears throat> that would identify vulnerabilities uh, in one of the entities that's reporting the data. Um, from an economic competitive point of view, if you can make inferences from the data about uh, the way the other people are doing things that um, you, the, <clears throat> the data providers would wish not to have provided uh, be inferred. Uh, there are some real foundational issues here uh, in, in data privacy in this, in this space. And so that's part of the, the risk assessment. What are the risks of, of sharing data? Um, I think I am convinced that the data analytics uh, in, in uh, resiliency for energy delivery systems is, is a huge area. Um, going back to the story of if things are awash in data, we have all this data, the potential with the you know, emerging technologies and data analytics to analyze that data, to be able to make conclusions, inferences about the presence of intruders, about uh, places where things might not be resilient or um, in, the, in the event um, of an actual uh, uh, event, an event of an event, um, that's, that's happening, watching the data to help one be able to respond quickly and appropriately to what's, what's going on. So analysis of data, um, I am convinced, is, is going to be a very significant component of what it is that we ought to be doing in this center. Uh, Part of what we'll do is, has to do with human and organizational decisions. There's an echo in here talking about you know, speaking to the decision makers. So we need to understand um, how humans in general and decision makers in particular and organizations view uh, this whole security and resilience piece uh, so that we can communicate with them in terms that they understand um, to be effective. Uh, quite a bit of interest in the Center on Resilient um, uh, energy deliver systems, uh, architectures and, and networks doing things like looking at the potentials of using software defined networking to increase resilience, to uh, engineer uh, networks that have known provable properties, um, to have uh, the ability to craft networks that are able to respond, isolate in the event of, of attacks with known uh, with known properties. Um, it's, a, it's a great technology that allows one to do some engineering, some fine engineering of, of network stuff 
um, that will allow us to improve resiliency of, of the networks that are in the EDS space in particular. And um, the impact of disruptive EDS technologies on, on EDS. And so to identify the gaps that um, impact resiliency uh, in anticipation of the coming technologies uh, which are likely to threaten it. So I think that is, oops, not up, not up. one last thing. Um, and that's the, the validation and verification piece. Uh, so part of that um, has to do with providing access to um, our test bed, to um, our research and development partners, um, to allow them to design, execute, and analyze experiments without having physical access. Uh, part of that has to do with nailing down the understanding of when you can federate test beds and, and provide the technology for that uh, when it makes sense to do that. And then part of it has to do with actually designing and executing uh, validation and verification um, uh, evaluations, which are you know, the last step in the, in the CRED-C technology development process. <sighs> okay, so that's CRED-C. What's next? Industry Day. All right, so um, we had Industry Days with TCIPG that were in the fall in the past. Uh, for timing reasons, uh, we will move to a springtime schedule with CRED-C. The first one is coming up on uh, March 28th through 29. Um, we have uh, been talking about um, the structure of this. Part of it will be that we'll have folks that'll get up and give uh, short um, position pieces. Uh, maybe five minutes each, and we're soliciting proposals for that. We are working on designing breakout sessions, so we'll take our group of 200 or however many people show up and identify areas of interest where smaller groups can uh, get together and talk. What we are trying to accomplish by this is to really elicit from industry their view on the state of things right now. So this is a very industry come to us focused sort of event. So it's by invitation. Um, and so if you're an industry, or not an academic, I guess is, is the way to read industry, uh, and would like to attend and haven't gotten an invite, then just contact us and we'll see that that is, uh, that is taken care of. So there are some deadlines there. Uh, you can contact us um, for uh, details on that. There's a URL there, or just uh, send an email uh, to, to Sherry. Um, or Al, and they, they can give you that information. And speaking of contact, why we are all about social media, aren't we? So there we are doing, oh, the web. I know about the web. Okay, so we've got URLs. And then there's this bird thing. Um, and then there's the, you know, there's the F thing. I, I sort of hesitate to say that, but in any case, there are other ways of, 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 of communicating uh, with us, which I am told by um, communications people who do not look gray like me that this is the going thing. And so, you know, we're all about the going thing. And so uh, communication uh, through all these ways. And so with that, I see that I am uh, finished with the prepared presentation. Um, I guess we can take questions now, if there are any. I knew that I could count on Prosper to answer a question. And so it, I was awake at night saying, what is it that, because you always ask interesting questions, Prosper. So let's see. Thank you so much. Uh, I have two questions to ask. Uh, the first one is, uh, uh, from uh, yesterday to tomorrow, the innovation will be to bring oil, gas in uh, the research as well the resiliency dimension. So uh, when I take uh, both power system and oil and gas, there is two ways to do those research. I hope that uh, the goal will be uh, to look for the intersection between a uh, power system and oil and gas. Talking about intersection, there is a way, two ways to get intersection. The first one is what is called parallel convergence, which is we move with power system, we move with oil and gas, we hope that at the end of the five years, we're gonna get some intersection. The second one will be maybe in the year one, we define the point of intersection 
and then we'll be working toward that target. So and my question was, which one do you envision as a point of intersection? If the goal is to get that intersection as soon as possible and to lead the research in such a way, uh, my second question will be uh, talking about uh, the test bed. How do you see uh, the test bed contribute to that intersection? What I mean is we have the expertise of test bed maybe in Houston and the power system in Illinois. How do we come together? And uh, my last question uh, is... <laughs> oh, time's up, sorry. <laughs> my last question is about the adding point of microgrid as a research. So I wanted to know if you can share with us from the seven organizations in the new project where the lead is coming from about the microgrid research. Thank you. Okay, question the first. I was actually trying to keep track of this. Um, we have uh, written a deliverable in our first year to the Department of Energy to do an analysis looking for the commonalities and the gaps between resiliency in the power system and in oil and gas. So we will be looking for where those intersection pieces are so that we can say, if, I do, if we do research here, this has direct impact to both the power side and the oil and gas side. But these are different systems, and there will be different problems, and we'll identify what those are um, as well. In the near term, of course, the idea is to find the intersections. The longer term, then it's a matter of prioritizing um, the, the, the things that are remaining. We cannot solve um, all of those. Uh, with respect to the test bed, there are test beds everywhere. And it, we will be using uh, the test bed here where it's appropriate. Uh, the researchers will be using test beds if they're oil and gas test beds with our partners. Uh, they'll be using those um, as appropriate as well. Talk some about the federation of these. You know, it remains to see how much, say, of the technology that we developed to provide remote access to a test bed will be carried over when we'll be able to carry over to some of these other test beds. And there's the possibility of fettering, but that's, that, that's, that's, that's longer term uh, sort of stuff. Uh, with respect to the distributed generation, um, I would have you look to your left and look to your right, and I would say there's the people that here at Illinois are working on distributed generation. Hello, if you flip back one slide to the workshop, so I goofed, I prepared that, and um, the hotel block is February 27th. It's on, yeah. So the hotel block deadline is actually the 27th, so that's my mistake, and I wanted to point that out. People have 10 extra days to get their hotel. Okay. Okay, uh, just to expand a little bit on the answer to Prosper's question, one of the activities that we're doing is precisely uh, what we call uh, intersector mapping and gap analysis, which is looking for commonalities, differences, the, the intersection that Prosper was talking about between the various sec sectors that we're looking at. Uh, we have a lot of uh, deep expertise in electric power at, at Illinois. Some of the new partner institutions have expertise in oil and gas. We've also expanded the uh, industry advisory board to include representatives from oil and gas. And uh, uh, coming, well, we have the right slide up here with the workshop. We will have uh, a presentation, a uh, featured presentation on oil and gas to uh, uh, get everybody familiar with, with that culture. And uh, we hope to understand this a lot more uh, in terms of the commonalities, differences, intersector mapping and gap analysis in the coming months. There's a question of whether the slides will be available. I'm assuming they'll be yes. posted. Yes. They'll be posted uh, along with the video. Um, and. Uh, does your center focus more on power delivery or gas delivery or? I, I would say um, we, we are including both, but um, the, I would say if you look at what we're doing, there will be more of a, a power emphasis than an oil and gas emphasis, if only because that's where we're coming from. Uh, and and um, I think of the two, then there, there's more of one than the other. Yes, Deming. Oh, you need to, you need to. Right. Get this recorded for all prosperity so that people will always be able to appreciate the depth and insight of the questions that okay. you ask. 
All right. So you mentioned the data analytics. Uh, that's uh, definitely important. Are there any other uh, topics uh, in the center that's related to high performance computing? In yes. The, the, yeah. So very good. Um, when we develop models of systems, particularly for uh, risk assessment, then some of these models um, could be very engineering, math um, oriented models that could require supercomputing. So I, I wouldn't say that it, it, it stands out in the way that I think data analytics does, but uh, there is certainly a role for, um, for high performing uh, computing here. All right, so um, they're telling me to cut, so um, thanks very much, and uh, come back for the next seminar.